While I was making the video about the Blackout Buddy, which is the water-powered torch or the water-activated flashlight, I briefly mentioned about how it's, uh, galvanic corrosion is a, an, an issue with boats and the reactions between different metals. And I thought it would be worth covering in its own video because it's one of these things that, you know, you might not have an application for the knowledge of a galvanic isolator, but maybe one day you will, and, or maybe someday you'll come across a situation like this and it will be suddenly be really useful to know this. So this is a copper coin again with a, a lead soldered onto it, onto lead-based solder, which is also taking part of the reaction, and a steel washer, which originally had zinc on it, but I think most of the zinc has been eaten off by now through the other experiments. So if I, uh, this is sitting in salty water, and if I turn the, the meter around to volts, it's, it's not really that dramatic. It's about 180 millivolts. It's nothing really major. It's not even half a volt. Uh, but there still is a potential difference between the two metals. And if I turn this around to the current setting, it's a milliamp or two. It, it, I mean, for keep in mind that these are very small bits. These are about 25 millimetres sort of inchish in diameter. So um, on larger bits of metal, it would result in much higher current. But anyway, let's scale this up, shall we? And show where the real problems occur. So let's imagine a much larger... A container of salt. So here's a dock. Here's the sea, which is a very large container of salty water, and it's uh, lapping up there. And then you've got a boat with its hull under the water, and its hull is made of generally made of steel. So that's the boat floating the water, and. So let's say that it's an iron hull to the boat, it's steel, it's, you know, it's going to be something like that. And the dock uh, has just, it's got random, it's got everything in it, it's based on its every mineral under the sun, plus it's going to have an electrical uh, facility panel on it for connecting to the boat. So imagine now that the, the boat connects. Up to now, if the boat's floating in the sea, it's just a piece of iron floating in the salty water. It's not a major issue. You do get corrosion, um, can occur, but you can also, it's quite easy to deal with just the, the boats on its own by using what's called a sacrificial electrode, which can just be bolted onto the boat and it can be made of zinc or uh, magnesium or aluminium, usually zinc, and it will preferentially corrode um, with a, an electric chemi chemical reaction instead of the, the steel or the iron of the boat itself. However, when you connect your boat to uh, the shore power, you've got live going across and it's not connected directly to the shell of the boat, it's going into the electrical distribution system. You've got your neutral and it also goes across, uh, but again, it's not connected directly to the electrical system of the boat, it's the metalwork system of the boat itself. But then you have a problem, you've got the ground connection and it goes across and it is actually physically bonded onto the metalwork of the boat for, saf boat for safety reasons. And at that point, you've got an iron electrode. You've got, say for instance, let's say the dock has quite a lot of copper present through pipework and stuff like that. And now you've connected them together with a wire. And that's basically shorting these two together. And the current you saw on the meter um, is going to flow. And... It may just be it may be a milliamp or less here, but keep in mind that the area of, of metal on a boat is going to be massive, and this can result in serious corrosion problems. And it, I was sent a picture, I was sent a link to a website showing this, uh, and this is a boat uh, in Australia called the Pirate Party Boat, and this boat seems to have spent a lot of its time sort of moored up, and they just connected electrical system across, and then... They, they had it in dry dock for maintenance and found it was suffering really serious corrosion that had been caused by the electrical connection to the dock. And initially they tried saying that, you know, that's the dock's problem because their electricity had caused it. And the dock had turned around and said, you know, it's not our problem, it's because you didn't do the correct thing regarding electrical connection. And here is what actually happens. You see this earth connection here? Keep in mind, you get the two bits of metal, but there's, in this case... Uh, it's really, it's low, it's, it's a fraction of a volt differential, but it's enough to cause current flow along that earth wire, that earth bond, and cause that, uh, you know, cause that sort of current path 
through the salty water and through that wire that causes the, the rapid corrosion and the sort of destruction of the iron. So what they do is they break the earth connection and they don't just break it clean. You can't do that. For safety reasons, you can't break the earth connection. It's just, you know, it needs to be there for safety. So otherwise you could effectively get the boat, Could the whole boat could become live with respect to the dock if you touched it. You know, there could be some current would leak, but uh, it, it really, the earth connection has to be in place. So what they do is they put what's called a galvanic isolator on the earth connection. So if this is one uh, end of the earth connection, and that's going to the boat, all they do is they put two diodes face, facing that way, and two diodes facing that way. So two diodes in series, uh, and then uh, times two connect in verse parallel. And what this means that you, is that you're going to drop one volt across that. It still means that uh, there's plenty of extra, you know, that it's not going to affect the operation of the earth and grounding to trip breakers or cause uh, RCDs or GFCIs to trip. But uh, it's going to isolate the that tiny potential difference that causes the current flow through these wires by that one volt. And it doesn't sound that much. But then keep in mind, this, this is a single cell battery just composed of the two dissimilar metals. It's not going to be that high a voltage. So the ways they can create this voltage differential is like this. Quite often bridge rectifiers are used, but big, chunky, stud bridge rectifiers. I'm looking around seeing I thought I had, so yes I do. Here we have big, chunky bridge rectifiers. And if you draw the schematic of a bridge rectifier out, it looks like this. You've got four connections, and this is the traditional way a bridge rectifier is drawn. And all the diodes point towards the positive end. Positive, negatives at the opposite side, all the other end of the diodes point to the negative. And normally the bridge rectifier is used to convert AC to DC and if, you know, if that end was positive it would flow through the diode towards the positive, if that end was negative that would, this back diode would then fact act as a gate for the negative and whatever polarity it is it will always actually positive will always be diverted to positive and negative and will always be diverted to negative but um, if you draw that a slightly different way and you draw it like this so the two diodes in series there another two diodes in series here there that's the AC connections that's the positive connection, and that's the negative connection. You'll realise that a, a bridge rectifier is can be used just as a, a pair of diodes in series plus another pair in parallel with them pointing in one direction. So effectively it's using all the diodes in here uh, just to create one pair of diodes pointing from the negative to the positive. And in the case of uh, many of the galva commercial galvanic isolators, all they do is they get two of these bridge rectifiers, and they put one round one way and one round the other way. So that's the AC connections in the middle that just don't get connected at all. And that's the negative side and that's the positive side and all they do is they just link them like that. And then that's the uh, boat or whatever it is that you want to protect, and that's the um, ground on the supply. So I, now you can see that effectively you've got a, a cluster of diodes with the in series going from in that direction, then a couple of cluster of diodes going in that direction, and that does the job. And the, normally the physical implementation of this would be a big heat sink. It doesn't. It's not going to get hot because you shouldn't really have major earth flow, uh, earth earth current flow. But you have to allow for the fact it could happen. And they'll just put a couple of bridge rectifiers like this. They'll bolt it onto that. And if you look at these rectifiers, you'll see they've got the uh, they've got two blades pointing that way, 
another blade point that way and then one that's completely different to all the others in the direction it points and that's the positive and it's usually printed in the back as well or the side. So that's the positive, the one diagonally opposite is the negative uh, and then the other two are the AC. So what they'll often do is they'll just cut these lugs off, they'll cut the AC ones off and they'll connect the positive one to the negative the other uh, negative there, positive there, connected across and then that's the wires that will go out, that's the boat and earth connection so it's a nice simple arrangement but I did work out, I thought, can you do this with a single bridge rectifier? and I worked out you could, if you actually bridge the negative and the positive then if whatever uh, polarity it is, say that's positive at that end, it will go through that diode across the link and then through that diode, so that's your two diodes in series and likewise, if that then became the negative and this became the positive, it would go through that diode, across the link, through that. So you could do it with one, but having said that, it's quite important to consider the things that can happen here because um, if you've got a, even if you've got a GFCI or an RCD that's going to detect the, you know, a, a, even a small leakage current, what you can have, you can have a dead live-to-earth short circuit and initially a lot of current's going to flow. And there's a, an issue that, you know, most of the, most of the time a rectifier like this will fail dead short if it's really exposed to a massively high current pulse. But um, you really don't want it to fail open circuit. You want to keep the integrity of the earth. And I suppose that if you, you've had electrical incidents on your boat, then really it's a good idea to actually check the integrity if you have one of these galvanic isolators and the way I'd suggest doing that is to uh, use your diode check in your meter and look for the two diode junctions in series. So go from the negative towards the positive and you should get roughly about one volt to show that the two junctions are intact. Uh, that's the, basically going sort of half a volt per diode. So they're, they're interesting, you know, it's interesting technology and it does the same issues with like steel and copper and liquid are much closer to home as well. If you think of your heating system, if you've got a central heating system in the house, you've got that water being pumped around the radiators. The pipes are made of copper and the radiators are made of steel and that's why you quite often get corrosion of the steel radiators and why you have to add uh, corrosion inhibitors into the water that's circulating in the radiators to try and prevent that. The same things also apply to the ethylene glycol solutions put in cars for the um, coolant systems. They also have to have uh, corrosion inhibiting chemicals put in because of the dissimilarities of different metals within the, the engine system, the aluminium block and uh, other metal components. So it's, it's all very interesting. Uh, strange that you know you wouldn't think that could have such an effect but it does that you know boats can just physically corrode really rapidly just because they were connected to the uh, the supply with the, the actual the dock side supply without that simple little thing in between and certainly if you if you if for a much larger supplies I'm guessing that they probably have huge studs a welder grade stud diodes keep in mind that the diodes are not going to see much voltage theoretically all they're going to see is about roughly 1 volt each one's combined forward voltage in reverse the other so the diodes don't have to be rated at terribly high voltage but what really matters is they're related rated for a very high current just to allow for those scenarios that maybe you plug into a dockside supply that doesn't have earth leakage protection um, and then you know under those circumstances quite high fault currents could flow but um, yeah it's an interesting subject a, a weird subject and it's kind of useful to know that can happen so now the science is out the way let's zoom up the cardboard box and apply some power to actually accelerate the corrosion of these coins and see how they react so the bench supply is currently set to uh, 1 amp current limit and 4.5 volts. So connect it in sort of reverse polarity to the other. The 2 pence coin immediately goes black and starts giving off green coppery salts. And connect it the other way around. Current is about 400 milliamps. The other coin, the steel one, starts um, fizzing 
And the copper one seems to actually clean off. It seems to then sort of like the coating that went on, I guess a coating got deposited onto it, starts to per clean off and it starts to sort of clean up again. So let's uh, push the voltage up here just in a reckless manner just to accelerate it all along. Oh, blimey, it's beginning to look like one of those sort of foot treatments now. So let's uh, reverse it again. Oh, that's interesting. The copper coin initially started cleaning up and it didn't do the reaction and then it suddenly the black swept right across it again. I think ultimately that's down to a plating effect and then the plating has to be reversed. And earlier on while experimenting with this and the, uh, measured the current between the two of them actually once I'd taken the power supply off and they'd charged up like a battery and it gave off approximately 45 milliamps just between the two coins through the liquid. Kind of intriguing. There's a whole load of chemistry going on right now and quite frankly I'm not 100% sure what all of it is. It's going to involve lots and lots of chemical compounds. See, there's that delay as it sort of gets rid of the coating and then it starts fizzing. That's very weird. Intriguing too. Quite entertaining. Quite enjoying it. Hmm. Yes, and then as, after a while the water just gets absolutely manky. You know, that's the like the principle of that detox thing. Oh, talking of the, the foot detox thing, yeah, that female doctor who actually said you should drink some of that manky water that came off it because it was like, you know, custom nutrients for you from your own feet. And it's like, what? Very odd. Oh, yeah, this is actually going so dark now that it's a very heavy particulate coming off. That's going very black. I wonder how long it would... I'm guessing that, you know, it doesn't take much metal to create a lot of colour, so I'm not sure how long this would last. Uh, before the coins corroded away completely. But the current, even at 6 volts now, is only about 200 milliamps. And it's still having that profound effect. Yes, intriguing.